I don't know who's going to show up and when they're going to show up. Okay, I'm going to mute. Okay. Um, going to start sharing. Oh, hi, there's Astrid. Okay. Hi, Astrid. We're just about to get started now. We're waiting on a few other people to um, sign on, but we're going to get started because it's already almost 35. And I know that there are some people who um, are going to be late. And I know that there are some people who couldn't make it today. So let us get going. I'm just going to turn off my screen here, sorry. Um, there we go. So just to um, recap where we left off last week, um, we were looking at um, painting from about the year from Confederation, so around 1867 until about 1910, because that is when um, that is when uh, Impressionism, Modernism really like took over the uh, the art scene, so to speak. Um, and when we left off, we left off at um, Ozias Le Duc. We looked at a few of his different paintings, which we'll just slide through quickly here. This one was the phrenology, the three apples, which we were talking about um, had significance because his father was a carpenter. So it's placed um, strategically on a wooden table to um, make mention, make reference to his uh, carpentry as his profession. The apples for the fact that the family had uh, orchards up in Mont saint hilaire and also to as kind of an homage to the Holy Trinity because um, Ozias Le Duc was a very religious man and worked a lot also in uh, church painting. Here again was the still life with the lay figure. Um, we talked about how everything in this painting had to do had some reference to religion um so it was kind of ironic that they named it still that he named it still life with a lay figure because the, the title focuses just on the lay figure whereas the the lay figure is surrounded by religion in the image then we looked at more of his uh genre studies his realist um kind of portraiture portraiture slash genre um, so here we had the boy eating bread. Here we had um, the young student slash perhaps artist, as we can see that he has quills, possibly paintbrushes um, in the glass, and he seems to be studying. This one was a little bit more relaxed than the other one because of his hair was a little bit more messy. And so it gives the impression of a little bit um, more relaxed pose, posture and feel to the painting. And then the reader, which is actually um, Le Duc's sister in this painting. And again, we discussed the fact that in his, in the imagery, in his uh, genre portraits, um, the the sitter, so the the the, uh, the subject is always doing something, never looking straight at the camera, uh, at the camera, at, at the artist who's painting. And then here was the um, Shocket Farm, a country house in the distance with a barn in the winter. Um, it's in the Richelieu Valley, um, just outside of, uh, or just inside of uh, Belle. And the Choquet family was a family that he knew well. And we talked about um, the idea of the Canadian winter scene. So I had brought this up a few times saying that one of the things that impressed me about Canadian artists is their ability to take essentially a, a semi a semi monochromatic um, palette 
and give it so much variation, despite the fact that, you know, the, the, the image is predominantly covered in snow. And then this was um, the birthplace of Ozias Leduc, his family home that was in his house for, uh, in his family, I should say, for a few generations up in Mont saint hilaire And then we ended with um, the green apples, which I strategically put as the last image that I showed of his because I felt like it was a culmination of all the different styles that we had seen. It um, is a landscape because you can see the land in the back, you can see the apple orchard. Um, it's kind of a still life at the same time because the apples themselves are, are in the forefront. It almost feels like it could be a, a portrait of the apples because they are so, um, like there's so much detail to them and they're so central to the image. And it also feels a little bit like a genre scene because you know that their family were um, were working in, in the apple orchard. And this brings us back to the idea of like them working in the field. So it's kind of a genre scene in that sense. And this is where we um, left off. So as we move forward, here we have a image that actually that it falls into impressionism and it's by Laura Muntz Lyle and we're going to see um, this image we're going to see some work from her as we move forward but I just wanted to put it into this section because it shows you what's happening in art around this time so as we move closer to 1910 as we come into the 19 to the 1900s um, this is uh, this imagery of the looser brush strokes and the um, like the, the brush strokes that you can see the more visible brush strokes and the softer imagery um, is starting to come into play. Now, Laura Mons Lyle and this, you know, it came into Canada later than it came into um, France into into Europe, but I wanted to show this because this is an early um, image from Impressionism from Muntz Lyle. And the reason why it seems like it's so early for Canadian Impressionism is because at this time, although she's a Canadian artist, she was studying in um, France. So that's why these artists that would go to France and a lot of the, a lot of the Canadian artists did go to do stages or they would go on, on, a, on a trip and stay for a year or two and, and study from the masters and go to the Louvre and, and take these courses with other prominent artists. Um, it was them who brought back the style of impressionism to Canada. So this is an early image that started, that came out on, on the Canadian art scene and started to make people talk about this new sort of looser, softer, more expressive um, style and painting that was coming about. Here we have um, Horatio Walker. The um, from wash with washing sheep, and again, this is towards the end of the of like the idea of, of post confederation painting, and we're coming into impressionism. And here, you know, the previous image we saw it was very soft and almost blurred a little bit. This image is the trees you know you can get the feeling that there's wind in the trees because there seems to be movement you get the same feeling with the water the white caps um on the on like the, the little waves in the water that have been that are very pronounced um as the shepherd is washing the the sheep uh, or the farmer i should say shepherd or farmer, um, but you can see that that the brush strokes are changing. You can see that painting is evolving and this is when, when things in the art world really start to change. Now here at the same time, you're still having, you know, this is 18, this is um, 
from, it should be 1895, not 1995, sorry. Um, but you see that this realist style is also still very present. Now this reminds us of, it, it's very reminiscent of the style that Ozias Leduc was using in his genre scene. So this is um, George A. Reed, and he, in this painting, delved into his childhood memories to create a realist triptych drawing lots. So the scene shows three boys drawing lots with straws as they lounge on a brick wall. The rhythmic order of the composition is created by the horizontal line of the wall in the central panel, which is framed by the vertical trees in the side panels. This adds a decorative aspect to the narrative of the painting in which Reed captures the social and artistic climate um, of the time. So Reed championed public art and believed art should be integrated into daily life. Him and his wife were both painters and they were pillars in the Toronto art community. Reed was a leading, a leading um, exponent of the arts and crafts movement uh, and a Canadian master of genre painting. He attributed a social function to art as a means to, um, to further civic ideals. In 1894, he also founded the Society of Mural Decorations and in 1903, the Arts and Crafts Society of Canada. So a real prominent figure um, in the art scene. And I thought that this painting was um, interesting to show because of the fact that it is a triptych and really for a long time, um, you know, we used to see triptych art a lot in the Renaissance, mostly art that was um, religious. The idea of a triptych, you know, being three panels, oftentimes back in the Renaissance when it was three panels, it had, it was like I said, religious and it had to do with the idea of the Holy Trinity. But here, um, Reed has bought, brought the triptych into a genre scene, which we don't often see, especially not during this era, especially not in Canadian art. These kind of mixing styles here. So this is um, an untitled painting by African Canadian artist, Edith Hester MacDonald, and it portrays a small herd of cattle in a um, mountainside meadow. The colors and the texture, um, you know, from the lighting of the picture of the canvas, you can really see um, the textural quality of it. There's a lot of, there's a lot going on here and it actually feels it has a little bit of a feel of um, kind of colonial art that would show um, that would show the idea of the native in with like the buffalo, but that native is not um, present. It's just the buffalo. The buffalo are really the center stage for this um, painting, and although they are set in nature. It's a very close up image, so the focus is less on the nature behind them and more of the um, how the, the buffalo are juxtaposed against the background. It's almost like their bodies um, mimic the rolling hills and vice versa. I wanted to show this painting because of the fact that, um, you know, I, I try and show um, female artists as much as possible. Um, but also I believe that this is the, other than some of the indigenous um, artists that we saw in that section, this is the first um, black artist that we are seeing as female or male coming out of Canada. Um, and it's taken this long. So we're at the beginning of the 1900s. Here's uh, Robert Whale, the Canadian Southern Wh Railway at Niagara from 1870. I wanted to show this painting. I, I kind of put it in last minute because of the fact that it shows all of the um, important aspects of what's happening in Canada around that time. We have a focus on the Canadian Railway, which was expanding its tracks at this time. We talked about how um, 
the owners of the Canadian Pacific Railway paid artists to, um, or not paid them, but didn't charge them to board the train. They gave them free room and board on the train in exchange for the um, service of painting the Canadian landscape because it was considered to be kind of marketing for the um, CP rail. So we have the, the rail being shown here. We have not just the train, but the railroad as well. And it also comes across as a romantic landscape because we have the small people in the center, um, the bottom center, and then you have like the vast landscape around it, which plays into the whole romantic landscape with nature being so grandiose and it being so large in comparison to um, humans. And then you have the idea of industrialization too, because you have that sort of, for that time, modern looking bridge um, that has been constructed. And you have two um, cities on either side of the, of the river that are being connected by the bridge. So the idea again of industrialization of cities and towns being connected um, by technology, by the, by the new technology of what was being uh, created in that era. And here from Robert Whale, we have um, a nature scene because we hadn't seen these for a while. You know, when the, the colony, when it, it first, people, the Europeans first started coming over here, they would do these nature, um, nature studies to sort of record the different kinds of animals and birds and plants that they found, but it was really used just as, as a documentary kind of purpose. And then when photography came in, photography took over for these kinds of documenting um, practices. But then it kind of comes back around this time as more of an artistic form. It's almost like a still life slash genre scene, but it focuses on, on animals. So then people started around this time is when people started painting animals like for the, the joy of it rather than for the, the documenting purposes. So here I'm going to show a few images from John A. Fraser. Um, it'll be the last images that I show from this section, and then we're going to move into um, Impressionism. Um, th although this one is oil, Fraser works um, predominantly in watercolors. And um, he started working out in nature, not just um, in the studio. So. His and his landscapes are quite grandiose. These, this one here is is a romantic um, is a romantic landscape as we see that the there is a boat and there is a um, a fisherman um, there beside his boat. But if we look here, it's he does his watercolors um, in such a beautiful way and doesn't necessarily add in the human aspect of it. So we get to really focus on the beauty of the landscape and not necessarily the landscape in comparison to, um, to humans. So the beautiful um, mountains with the snow on top, and we're still able to get that feeling of snow, even in watercolor, which is very hard. This is watercolor over graphite. I've never yeah. heard of that, Erin. Well, over graphite just means that it was sketched first. It was sketched uh -huh. in pencil and then, and then watercolor um, used after that. Okay. So the colors aren't graphite as no. with watercolor over top. No. Okay. Exactly. It was just that it was sketched in first. Okay. It's hard to get any kind of, um, like if you've ever painted in watercolor, um, because the brush is so soft and the paint is so like fluid, 
it's a little bit harder to get like like hard lines when it comes to watercolor. So oftentimes the artists would use the under sketch of the graphite to form their lines so that they could kind of fill in thereafter. I, that water with the fine lines of the mountain in it, that's pretty amazing in watercolor. I, I don't well, know yeah, you and, and that's why, you know, white doesn't really exist in, in, in no. watercolor because it, it, there's no, like when you use white, it has to be opaque for it to show, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was able to achieve the, the snow on the mountain so well is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. Here's another example of his, this one, we're back to oil. But if you, if you think about the difference between the white in the watercolor and the white in this one, which is oil, there's not that much of a, a difference. You almost wonder whether he added just a little bit, I mean, but you can't really put oil or back then anyway, there's no way you could put oil on paper because it would go right, it would like soak right through. Um, but quite remarkable when you compare his oil to his watercolors, um, the fact that I, I I feel like the the detail is even better in his watercolors than it is in his oil. And then I think that this is my my favorite of the examples from him. It's not often um, either that you see these kinds of um, like unrealistic colors being used in in the landscape to portray the, the the countryside like he uses a lot of well actually we saw it I can't remember which artist it was but it was the the rock cliff with all the seagulls and I said that it almost reminded me of like a more exotic painting because there were like pinks and blues being used in there and we see these these blues and purples um come back up here and for sure, that's not the actual color of, of the mountain of the rock, but the colors are very, um, they're realistic in the foreground, but then in the background with the purple and blue hues, it just makes a, a beautiful contrast. And that will take us to the end of our post-Confederation painting. And then we move into Impressionism, the group of seven and the Beaver Hall group. Before we move forward, did anybody have any questions or comments about um, these last slides that we have looked over? No. All right, well, please don't hesitate if you do to just uh, turn on your microphone or you could write it in the chat if you prefer. So Canadian artists, um, as I said, begin, began um, going to Paris in the late 1870s to expand their artistic training while also exploring Europe um, and its art collections. Working outdoors around Ile de France, um, Brittany and other artistic hotspots Many Canadians developed an abiding interest in landscape painting while also absorbing impressionist techniques and incorporating these into their work. So, you know, that means that this didn't really happen overnight, that people went from realistic painting all the way into um, full-blown impressionism. You start to see, um, you know, little details being changed and certain aspects of their painting styles, which is why I showed some um, impressionist examples as we move closer to the end of last section, because you, you see the transition kind of starting to happen. Um, the Canadian public did not immediately accept Impressionism, as I believe I mentioned last week. Many artists returning home from their studies abroad faced obstacles, selling their work and gaining critical acceptance. Um, However, this did not deter them. Finding the Canadian art scene ripe for invention, Canada's Impressionists began introducing radical new techniques to represent local subjects. They painted landscapes that captured the bright winter light. They explored both rural and urban street scenes as well as um, vernacular activities. Women artists such as Florence 
Carlisle, Helen McNichol, and later uh, Mabel May challenge traditional gender rules and modes of representing the modern woman in their work. As the work of Canadian Impressionists became better known and more widely appreciated, it began to shape broader art movements in Canada. The emphasis on interpreting rather than simply reproducing the landscape would inform the work of the Group of Seven, while a focus on modern life and the city influenced the bold compositions of the Beaver Hall Group. Canada's Impressionist pioneers were innovative, experimental, and daring. They made an indelible mark on Canadian art. So here we have uh, Laura Muntz Lyle, which I showed you an example of her work um, just towards the end of last section with the uh, mother and child, mother uh, at the child's, the foot of the child's bed, the child's sick um, in bed. And so, as I mentioned, Laura Muntz Lyle um, was one of these artists who had gone over to Paris to work and study. Um, and so she was one of the first female artists to bring back this uh, new and modern style that she started incorporating into her paintings and which eventually uh, changed her paintings completely to the Impressionist style. So one of the most accomplished um, painters of her time, she had a successful artistic career um, in Europe, not just studying in Europe. She lived in Paris as a single woman during the 1890s, which wasn't very common, and she supported herself through teaching and administrative work at school. She was elevated to studio head at the Académie, Académie uh, Colarossi, and through sales um, of her art, she was fully able to support herself. She was the first Canadian to receive the distinguished honorable mention at the Paris Salon exhibition in 1895. Upon her return to North America in 1898, she established a studio in Toronto and began teaching as well as exhibiting um, widely. She quickly gained critical acclaim at home and in the United States and won medals um, for exposing in Buffalo and in uh, Louisiana. She was a member of the Ontario um, Artists Society and she also um, did illustrations for Studio Magazine, which was a, a magazine that was published in England. So, so quite um, well-versed and quite widely versed when it came to um, selling her art and making her art in, in different places. So you can see here that um, one of the aspects of, um, of impressionism that she's bringing in is kind of that blurred background. And in the foreground, the pink dress is really the, is really the subject here. It's less the, the girl, as you can see that the girl's face is also kind of blurred. Um, it's just very softly painted in, but the title says it all. It's the pink dress. It's not about the little girl in the pink dress. It's about the dress itself. And you can see because the dress itself is what has the most pronounced um, brush strokes. It would seem that she spent, the artist spent the most amount of time on the dress rather than on the girl wearing it or the background. So here's the girl with the daffodil, or sorry, a daffodil. Uh, we see a girl um, sitting there holding a daffodil. And it's interesting because as in the pink dress, you know, she's not talking about the sitter. She's talking about a certain detail in the painting that seems to be her prominent, uh, her predominant focus. In the last one, it was the dress and here it's the daffodil. So during Muntz's artistic career, uh, both the changing role of women in society, as well as the intimate bond between a mother and child became themes that were uh, universally celebrated in art. Seeking to portray a timeless subject, a number of internationally acclaimed women artists, including Berthe Morisseau and Marie Cassatt from France and from the French Impressionist movement, 
um, had made the motif of womanhood their primary theme during the 19th century. Depictions of women at work or in their domestic world celebrated women's strength and maturity. Notwithstanding the confines of the period um, and concentrating on moments in time, months sought to create a psychological study of a personality and convey the inner emotional life of her models um, in works such as A Daffodil Here, uh, which was acquired by the National Gallery of Canada in 1910. So months avoided sentimentality and in her compositions of women or mother and child, um, she strived to, or sorry, specifically with mother and child, she strived for the expression of love through restrained tenderness, which she saw as an expression of moral strength. So here you can see that the, um, the girl is quite softly painted and just in certain places does, does Munce Lyle place emphasis um, on the brush stroke. And it acts as a way of putting highlights on an otherwise quite dark painting. Here we have women reading. This, the dress in this painting like glows, it jumps off of the canvas. So the exploration of new themes such as women at leisure enabled her to project her own conviction as a professional artist and a feminist. With sensitive subtlety, she signaled in these works the newborn freedoms resulting from changes to women's roles in society and from the achievements of an industrialized age. While the right to want and deserve equality and recognition may appear natural today, for women of Munce's era, even the simplest need for personal growth or for restorative leisure and repose was subject to social mores and frequently the approval of male authority of a male authority figure. In her portraits of women at leisure, Munce consciously implied the entitlement of her female sitters to recreational and personal time. So in the, um, the woman reading, you know, doesn't seem bothered by the fact that she's just sitting down and relaxing reading. She deserves this time to herself. And I love um, the conviction in that statement about how Munce Lyle um, chose to represent her female figures in her paintings with a sense of entitlement of recreational and personal time. Like why should they need anybody else's approval to take this time for themselves? Now, aside from the um, social ideas behind this painting, um, just aesthetically speaking, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, you can see that again, like the background is kind of, it's less detailed, we get an idea of either curtains with like a bit of light shining through on that white stripe um, or perhaps like a thicker kind of tapestry. She seems to be sitting on a, on a windowsill seat though with cushions behind her. So I, I do believe that that is most likely um, heavy curtains. And the, the white in the top left of the image which um, as I said, is, is likely the, the light shining through the darker curtains. Um, it mimics the same white in her dress and balances out the image because otherwise, you know, the, the female is central to the, to the canvas and her dress is definitely a focal point. So that bit of white um, coming through the curtains just balances it out so it's not quite so heavy in the middle. Here we have portrait of Dorothy. So a major source of inspiration, um, children were a favorite and frequent subject of the artist throughout her career. The purity and innocence of her portraits of children have no parallel in Canadian art. In 1915, at the age of 55, she married her brother-in-law, Charles Lyle, following the sudden death of her younger sister. Adapting to her role of stepmother to 11 children, um, she installed her studio at home and continued to paint 
until her death 15 years later. So at that time in her life, this shift of all of a sudden becoming the stepmother to that many children, um, the only way that she could kind of keep her practice, her painting practice and career going was if she moved her studio home and painted what was happening um, around her, which basically was filled with children. We have a comment here in the chat. Is the reader in a wheelchair? No, um, I believe that she was sitting here. Let's go back. So you can see that there's like, it looks like a wood ledge, almost like, you know, one of those benches that, that like a reading bench right up against the window type thing. And it looks like there's a, a, a bunch, like a, the dark behind her um, to me is cushions um, up against that window and cushioning her back on the bench. And you can see that she has other books um, sitting beside her on that same bench. So um, here, what's interesting in this portrait of, of Dorothy is that, um, you know, in other examples of Munsleil's work that we've seen, there's always one element that seems to be painted in um, more concentrated than the others. And in this one, I, I don't see that. Like even though the, the flowers are in the foreground and Dorothy is kind of in the middle ground, you know, you have the background behind her, she's in the middle and then the flowers are in the foreground. But because of the fact that everything is painted in quite softly, she still remains the focus, even though um, the flowers are quite big and, and closer to the, and in the foreground of the painting. The painting is quite well balanced out too, though, because, you know, there's white at the top in the middle at the bottom, her skin color, like the rosiness of her cheeks. Um, you find that same color in what I believe are peonies, are they peonies or roses? Um, so everything kind of balances each other out, all the different elements. I think they're peonies. They seem to be more open than roses. This is um, probably my favorite example by her um, in this series anyway. So this is Oriental Poppies. I find that this has a very, um, like, kind of like a theatrical feel to it, like an enchanted feel to it. It reminds me a lot of Klimt's um, work. So despite still being governed by the strict gender rules of Victorian middle-class society and ahead of the shift to greater emancipation um, in the 20th century, Munz succeeded in pursuing her artistic aspirations and achieving recognition as a leading artist. She developed her own individual interpretation of the Impressionist style and through her use in rich color and subdued light, adopted a popular genre um, to communicate her sense of modernism and inspire the next generation of women artists. So that is, is seen here, you know, it's like, the facial features are a little bit more defined than everything else in the painting. Everything else seems to be quite um, loose and blurred, except for her facial features and the one hand that's reaching out to pick the poppy. <clears throat> Again, the colors here, you know, as we saw in the portrait of Dorothy, the rosiness of her cheeks is, um, is repeated in the pink of the flowers. Well, here we see the rosiness of her cheeks. Sorry, we see the redness of her hair repeated in the peonies, and in the peonies and the poppies, sorry. And it's this idea of, um, of attaching the human to nature, right? The idea that her 
we find in Dorothy that her skin color is the same as the flowers. And here we find that her hair color is the same as the flowers. It's the idea of like that connection between um, the girl or the woman and nature that we see repeated in her, um, in her paintings. And even the girl who's holding the daffodil, you see that the color um, that is used in her, for the highlight of her hair is repeated in the daffodil. Here's the last example by her. We have here um, the lullaby. So I've mentioned earlier when she said, when it was said that um, her compositions of mother and child strive for the expression of love through restrained tenderness, uh, which she saw as an expression of moral strength. So the look in the woman's face here and the mother's face, um, you know, she's holding her baby but she, she's not staring, she's not gazing down at her baby. She, did, she doesn't look like she's like in love, not to say that she doesn't love her baby, but I mean, she's oftentimes when we see um, images of mother and child, the mother will be gazing at the child with love. Here, we don't see that. She looks exhausted. She looks like she's in despair a little bit. And, and that is the idea of this kind of restrained tenderness. which is actually also quite feminist um, to portray this kind of um, feeling in the imagery at this time, because, you know, back in that day, it was, well, you're a woman, naturally you should have children and your children should be like the focus of all of your attention and your love. Like your job is, is to be a mother and women were, thought to and meant to love that job um, and not to say that this woman doesn't love it but you can see that she's having a moment of um, despair or of fatigue and that wasn't often depicted at this time. So here we move to um, Clarence Gagnon. So Gagnon was born in a small village in rural Quebec. Although he trained and maintained a studio in Paris for much of his career, he never lost his love of the Laurentians and the Charlevoix region of Eastern Quebec, which inspired many of his paintings. Gagnon's mother fostered um, his early interest for drawing and despite his father's wishes that he enter the family business, he began studying and drawing and painting, and in 1897, at the age of 16, under William Brimner, uh, a prominent artist at the time, he studied at the Art Association of Montreal. His early paintings of rural themes attracted the interest and subsequent patronage of the Montreal businessmen um, and collector James Morgan. With a monthly salary from Morgan, Gagnon was able to travel to Europe and study at the Académie Julien um, in Paris under um, Jean-Paul Laurent. And Gagnon distinguished himself early in his career by the quality of his engravings also, and won an honorable mention for his work at the Salon uh, de la Société des Artistes Français in 1905. So here we have Farmyard, uh, which you can see was completed in France in 1906. And so this is like, um, this is the, this is impressionism like through and through, you know, you have the um, yellows, which are, are very common and then the darkness of the trees. So this idea of light and dark being cast, in the painting without really using much black or white. The colors are softer, they're less stark. The chickens kind of fade 
or melt into the into the landscape. Everything kind of weaves together. Here is uh, the beach at Dinard. And um, this one is like, it kind of reminds us of George uh, Seurat and the, the French kind of like leisurely um, scenes that started to appear in impressionist painting around this time. Well, this is, I mean, that started to appear around this time in Canada. In France, it had been already going on for, you know, almost 15 years. But we get the idea that at the beach, it's windy. Not only can we see that the woman is holding her hat in the middle there, but we can see that her hair is sort of flying away um, in the wind. And this whole idea of, you know, the leisurely scene, people relaxing, women and children um, relaxing on the beach, which wasn't something that before Impressionism um, was really focused on in painting. And, you know, really all throughout the painting, it's like very, there's not like a, a, a wide variety of color. There's not a, a very varied color palette here. You know, it's basically blues and greens and whites, a little bit of pink, some kind of beige, but really what anchors the entire painting is that one figure in black in like this sort of cent just off center to the left. It really pulls the viewer's eye um, over there, like into the painting and really anchors all the rest of the colors. This is my favorite of his. This is the mill at the edge of the woods at sunset from Charlevoix in 1915. So in 1908, Gagnon returned to Paris, uh, to Canada, excuse me, and settled in Bay St. Paul, um, a region of uh, the Charlevoix, which became his preferred sketching area. From 1909 to 1914, Gagnon moved between Canada, France, and Norway, always working up the sketches he had made in Quebec. His career reached a turning point uh, when in Paris, when the Paris art dealer, Adrian M. Reitlinger offered him an exhibition in his Montparnasse gallery. Um, after 1913, at his Paris show, Gagnon portrayed the Canadian landscape almost exclusively and generally in wintertime. He invented a new type of landscape, a winter world composed of valleys and mountains, of sharp contrasts of light and shadow, of vivid colors, and of um, sinuous lines. He ground his own paints, and from 1916, his palette consisted of pure white, reds, blues, and yellows. So we see that his style has changed quite immensely from that farmyard um, scene to this, you know, in the farmyard scene, everything kind of like, you know, everything was kind of like earth tones. And, um, here we have these big contrasts. We have these bright reds, these cold blues, real juxtaposition between cold and like cool and warm colors on the canvas. Um, but really he used, he did the, the winter landscape, the idea of the winter landscape because the white in the winter landscape can really um, be played with in so many different ways can, depending on the, uh, like the, the lighting that's coming in against the white of the snow. So here it's the idea that the cool colors are in the foreground and it's the idea of like the shaded area and then the sun hits the barn and lights or hits the mill and, and lights it up with these warm reds.
and the you know the idea of when the um the liter literature talked about the sinuous lines like the trees do look kind of creepy and eerie in this painting Here, another example of that Canadian landscape with all that snow. So from 1924 to 36, Gagnon lived in Paris once again. He began devoting most of his energy to creating illustrations for two works um, of fiction, Le Grand Silence and um, Marie Chapdelaine, um, a story that celebrated Canadian frontier life. So during that time, he used a lot of the imagery that he had um, collected and created of Canadian winters, um, such as this one from the Bay St. Paul region to inform his, um, his creation of his illustrations for these two works that he was working on um, again in Paris. So here we see very little warm color. You see it in a few details um, in the roofs of the of the town in the cent in the in the center of the painting, but otherwise you just get the feeling of this sort of cold, clouded winter day um, in the Bay Saint Paul region. And then here, um, the pond, I wanted to show this painting juxtaposed against the, the other winter painting because um, such a difference between the palettes of color, which is another thing that really makes Canadian landscape painting um, so varied and so interesting is our different seasons and the different color palettes that come along with those changing seasons. You know, if you live in a climate where it's always, you know, the temperature doesn't vary very much, um, well, your color palette, and unless you're getting creative and you're thinking outside of like the, the realist kind of box, um, your color palette doesn't vary that much. But when you're a Canadian artist and you're a landscape painter and you're painting the outdoors, uh, depending on the time of year, you know, your, your palette varies quite extensively. Here we move on to um, Maurice Cullen uh, with the mill stream. So Cullen grew up in Montreal um, studying art privately and after attempting a commercial career, um, he studied sculpting. At age 22, he enrolled as a student at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And there he was met by many Canadian art students and changed to landscape painting, which I think was a good change because he seems quite fantastic at the idea of, um, of creating landscape. Like there's so many different fields in this painting, you know, foreground right, foreground left, middle ground, like there's so many different stages. It's a very complex um, design, this painting, but very successfully executed. From the stonework to the little waterfalls, to the trees, just beautiful. There's so much to look at in this painting. And it pulls you from like one corner to the other. I think one of the reasons why this painting is so successful is because the water was done so dark. Otherwise it, it would have kind of been too busy and felt like it was sort of lost in the mix. But I find that the darkness of the water really grounds the painting and separates the different sections so that your eye can take its time looking at each section and, and is able to break down each section rather than it just kind of melting together. Also the white of the water. Really, it's the contrast between the white and the dark green. 
that sort of allows everything to be broken up. And I think one of my favorite elements in this painting is the, um, the red chimney in the upper right corner. Just the same way as I said that in that beach painting that the, the small dark, uh, like the black dress type thing on the figure that was just off center, sort of grounded the whole painting. I, I feel like the red chimney in this is that for this painting. Here we have first snow. So in Paris, Cullen learned um, traditional French academic painting, but encountered Impressionism at the Barbizon School. So I believe I mentioned it last week. So the Barbizon School was like the precursor to Impressionism. It's kind of where it all came to these ideas. So the Barbizon uh, School was when they started painting out in the French countryside. And, you know, they started being able to have the tubes of paint that traveled with them rather than being forced to do sketches out in nature and then come back to the studio, their materials could travel with them. So the Barbizon School was, was really where everything started moving towards Impressionism. So he encountered um, Impressionism at the Barbizon School. He returned to Montreal in 1895. Um, he revisited Europe again um, between 1899 and 1902, and then again in 1925, when he painted in France, Italy, and the Netherlands, and North Africa. And he also served as a war artist from uh, 1918 to 19. In Quebec and Beaupre, Cullen painted outdoors um, in all seasons. So before we saw summer, and here we see winter. And again, with like the, the dark water that seems like it's ice that's like, it's just freezing over the idea of like the first snow. So it's really winter's just beginning. So um, I'm loving this dark water that looks like it's just in the process of freezing over. Here we have um, summer night. So again, changing from one season to the next. So he depicted landscape in accordance with local terrain, light and color. He composes landscape paintings and pastels in keeping with European and Canadian tradition. His innovative use of luminous impressionist influence colors um, influence the next generation of Canadian artists, especially the group of seven. So the sky in this painting is just incredible. Um, the texture created with the looseness of his brush strokes. And how that how the light just um, lands on the water. And like the thing that's painted in the least amount of detail here is the figure that's sitting on top of the haystack. The idea is just so that we should see, um, you know, like it, that it seems super shadowed. So it, it's really like a, it's actually a silhouette of the, um, of the man who's sitting on the haystack. So interesting to use the idea of silhouette in the painting while at the same time um, painting the bulls in, in pretty decent amount of detail. We haven't really seen um, silhouettes up until now, aside from the idea of like, you know, like 
the Italian um, way to do the, the chiaroscuro, which is like the extreme light, extreme shadow and highlight. It's almost like that's exercised a little bit here, but in an impressionistic way. Here we have fishing stages. So this painting, um, you can see like as it, as this painting sort of moves forward, this is quite abstracted. Um, it's really all about the, the color. And at first you can't even really see the, the fishing stages. You just see the, um, like you can't really see the houses on stilts there. You really just see the foreground um, to the left because of the, the bright color and, and the pink really draws you in. And then you see the background of like the, the field and the mountain, you see the water in between. And then you notice like a sort of wood structure on the top left and then your eye gets drawn to the middle where you can see that it's really um, like scaffolding that's that's been constructed but it's quite like I said abstracted. Any more comment? Find the sky is very Van Goghish. Yeah, well, this exact yeah, the sky has lots of movement in it, and that's why you're feeling that it's very. I, I didn't mean this one. I meant the one before. Oh, uh, yes. Also. Look at the one. Well, the one yes, I mean the one before actually. What um, what it reminds me of. We'll go back to it for a minute. Um. It reminds me a lot of Monet's Impression um, Sunrise, which was the painting by Monet that really coined the whole term for Impressionism. Like that's where Impressionism came from was in his Impression Sunrise painting. Um, and this painting actually reminds me more of, of Monet's work than of Van Gogh's work. Van Gogh did um, did a few paintings that had that were like in hay fields, and I feel like maybe it's the it's the color of the hay field that maybe reminds you um, of his work as as well. Workers in the in the hay fields is like a recurring theme among impressionist artists. I think it's like the Starry Night one when all the the movement in the sky, that's, I think, that's what well, it is. And there were two Starry Nights by Van Gogh. Um, mm -hmm. The one that's more popular, the one that's less popular, I should say, actually reminds me more of this one than the one that's more popular because the, scar, the, oh, yeah. the sky with the stars are, like it's smaller stars and the sky is uh -huh. more far back. On this one, I can almost, it, it almost looks as if it's been done by blotting instead of brushing the sky. I know that it's really interesting. I'd be, I'd be curious to see this painting in person. Yeah. Because I, it, it, the texture is very, very interesting on it. And there's, it's like the sky has almost, you know, in theory, the sky has almost no detail in it because it's really just yeah. the, whether that's the setting sun or the rising moon. Um, but otherwise it, it's just the color and there's a, a ton of detail in the bottom half of the painting, but because mm -hmm. of the treatment of the brush strokes in the sky, everything seems balanced. Like it almost seems busier than, than the bottom half. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like I said, I'd be interested to see uh, this is this painting is in the National Gallery in, in Ottawa. Um, so if anybody's there this summer, have a look. <laughs> uh, yeah, so back to this one, just to say that, um, so we see that, that his work gets more and more abstracted and his color palette here is incredibly varied. 
It's almost as if he took his, you know, saying before that he painted the the landscape and all the different seasons. It's almost like he he took a a color palette for all of the different seasons here and um, and used all of the different colors for this one. And then finally, we have here. I chose it because it's sunrise on Lac Tremblant, which is very close to where I live. <laughs> So I just, um, I thought it was um, interesting to show an image of something that is essentially just in, in our backyard for those of you who are, who are up north. And it's fun to be able to sort of, I mean, not to say that something in 1922 is necessarily recognizable here now, but um, the idea that, it, that it's so close, it, it, it's familiar. So again, here that use of um, dark versus light um, in a winter scene. We can see that there's a bit of a green tree there on the back right hand side. And there's some red up in the mountains. So maybe again, this is the beginning of winter or an early snowfall if there's still leaves on some of the trees. You know how sometimes we get that October <laughs> snowfall that we don't enjoy, but uh, it makes for an interesting uh, dynamic in, in the color scheme because you still have bright color up against um, the grays and, and whites and browns of winter. So here we move to another female artist, um, Florence Carlisle. So Florence Carlisle began her art training as a child in classes organized by her mother. Encouraged by the artist Paul Peel, she went, who we saw um, his painting last week, Astrid, I think you said that you have a cop uh, you, that you have that one at home. I do too. Um, so she went on to study in France under masters, including academic painter uh, William Bougereau. She returned to Canada in 1896 and set up studios in London and Woodstock, Ontario. And in 1897, she became the first woman to be elected an associate of the Royal Canadian Academy. She also established a studio in New York City. And in 1904, her oil painting, The Tiff, as we see here, was selected to appear in the Canadian exhibition at the Louisiana um, Purchase Exposition, where it won a silver medal. The Montreal Gazette described this painting, which is now in the permanent collection of the Art Gallery of Ontario, as a strong piece of work depicting a lover's quarrel and praised its execution as clear-cut and decisive. Which clear-cut and decisive are not usually words to describe a impressionist painting, <laughs> but um, uh, independent and resourceful, Carlisle traveled extensively and enjoyed a successful career in an era when financial independence was out of reach for most women, especially most women artists. And interestingly, um, the last 20 years of her life were spent in Crowborough, Sussex, England, where she and her partner, Juliet Hastings, bought an English cottage they called Sweet Hawes. So not only was she successful um, as an artist and able to pay her own way as an artist in that era, but she was also um, openly gay and bought a cottage, with, like it said, with uh, her partner. And they um, lived there together, which is also something that you did not see in the early 1900s. So good for Carlisle. <laughs> um, so aesthetically speaking, I, you know, again, I'm gonna mention that, that in a few paintings now we've seen that one little bit of color can kind of anchor a painting um, 
and or bring it to life. And here, the underdress that we see, um, that bit of red in the bottom middle does that for this painting. And the idea of repeating uh, color, connecting the, the figure to foliage, in this case, the foliage is on her dress, um, but we see the flower in her hair mimicked in the color of her rosy cheeks and then repeated again in the flowers on her dress. So the idea of repeating color to balance out your um, the frame of your painting, like the the like the 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 layout of your painting, really. And then besides her dress and her um, boyfriend or husband, whatever, um, basically the the background is done in different variations of greens which really complements the foliage on her, um, on her dress because it makes the whole painting kind of feel like a garden. I also find it quite comical that the painting is called the Tiff. <laughs> you know, Tiff is really not like a, a word that is used, like you, you, you wouldn't think to find that word in, a, in the title of a painting. I think it's very playful as a title. This is one of my favorites. So this is uh, Florence Carlyle, the studio. She was known, um, you know, among other things, um, she was known, her technique was was known to be very good at, at painting uh, sort of like material and, and clothing and, and tapestry and, and her treatment of detail um, in all of things fabric. And here we see that this painting is a, is a love letter type thing to, to that talent because between the different fabrics of her dressing gown of what she has on underneath it, of the different pillows, the sheets, the blankets, the tufted footstool in front of her. Um, there are so many different textures and patterns going on. And then we have her treatment of, of the vessels. So like the different um, vases and bowls and then the teacup. Again, like, although the, the color palette and, and the brush strokes aren't the same at all as Klimt, I get a feeling of like Klimt's work here because Klimt also, like we see in this painting, you know, everything was very, very busy around different colors, different patterns, different, you know, his use of like the gold leaf. And then it was like, you would, you would see a human's face and their the color of their skin standing out in contrast to all of the busyness around it and i feel that I, I you have that same feeling here with her face that looks like it's being like like sucked into the pillow almost um but her face and her hands really stand out against all the different color and patterns that are happening around And if you look um, at the paper that she's holding, you can see the word studio. So the title of the painting is actually written in the painting, which is really cool too. Here we have gray and gold. So the gray being her dress and the gold being her hair. Um, again, the, her, um, her ability to create flesh that, that feels, that looks 
looks like you can almost feel it. Like it looks so real. Um, and the flesh is what is painted in such high detail. Otherwise, everything is, is quite whimsical around it. So again, that same feeling that I mentioned before, um, and quite obviously done on, on purpose as, as a contrast, like her hair is almost the exact same color as the, as the wall behind her. It really kind of melts into it. Um, but her face against the brown um, of the table behind her really makes her face stand out a lot. I love the brush strokes, the treatment of the, of the gown. It feels so light and wavy and airy. And again, against the backdrop, like juxtaposed against the wood, the wood being so hard and solid and dark and crisp, it really makes the, the dress have that sort of like ethereal feel even more so. Ethereal, sorry. And this is um, the moth. So a pensive woman is lying on a, a chaise lounge at Zivan. Her arms and upper body propped on the armrest. Her face is bathed in the warm light from a lamp. Her long white dress forming a large diagonal stands out in contrast to the ambient shadow. This is what I mentioned before, the chiaroscuro. chiaroscuro. Um, the effect that heightens the overall sense of, of light against dark. So there's aspects here of uh, impressionism, but there's also aspects of uh, romanticism. Like the, the painting is executed in a very kind of romantic way. And the lamp, you know, this is very different from her other paintings as we saw that like basically in the past two or three paintings when we've looked at the face, the flesh is executed in such a way that it makes it look very, very realistic against the rest of the painting. Well, here it's almost the exact opposite. What seems the most real um, or the most um, detailed in this painting would be the lamp and the bottom of her dress, which is like really in the very foreground of the image. Like if you look at the top of her dress around her shoulder, let's say, um, compared to the part of the dress, dress that is sitting on the floor, they're very different in terms of the amount of detail that have been put into them. And, you know, in, in an image like this, you know, in the few previous images that we've seen, the, the subject in it, the person in it has really been the central idea in the painting. Whereas here we can tell that the human is not really the central idea because there's not really much emphasis or detail put on their, their face or their character. And that's what makes it like romantic in a sense. Oops, let me just fix this one. Does anybody have any questions or comments while I'm fixing this? Has anybody had any favorites go by so far? Lots of them. I'm anxious <laughs> now to go back to the uh, art gallery in Ottawa. Oh yeah, for sure. Here we go. 
So this is Afternoon in Venice. So this is different compared to um, her other paintings that we've seen because there is no human um, represented in it. This is a scene from um, of water and buildings from Venice. Kind of a hybrid between a landscape and a cityscape, if you will, for a city that is built on water. <laughs> so, um, here, really, what I, I find interesting is um, the water in the foreground, the amount of detail that has been put into it. There seems to be a lot of movement and there's a lot of um, reflection from what the shadows that are being cast from the sunlight and the different um, buildings around it. You know, another um, detail that's worth noticing here is the rest of the city on the other side of that little footbridge um, is really bathed, you know, it's quite obviously being bathed in the light from the sun, but it's all that same color. So the same way that we saw in Clarence Gagnon's winter landscape, where the shadow was all in cool, um, like blue hues, and then where the sunlight was hitting the mill, um, was bathed in, in this kind of like red light. So the same thing is, is happening here when you think about it just in a different way. So the buildings and the walkways and the footbridge are all of that sort of um, monochromatic like muted color that's very neutral. And then in the foreground, which, which gives the opportunity for, for higher contrasts. And then in the foreground, you have those sort of cool colors, that, that shadow, just like in the forest from Clarence Gagnon. And then in the background, you have that red light hitting like where the, where the sun is reflecting off of the buildings the same way that you had his red light, um, his red colors, where the sunlight was hitting the, the mill. So same kind of technique, different scenario. Here we move on to a fan favorite, um, Helen McNichol. So this is the, the little worker. So it shows a young girl on a hillside walking with a, a metal pail, her arm outstretched to balance the weight of her burden. She is alone in the landscape, but for a trio of accompanying chickens, a fence and shed are only just visible at the top of the canvas. The perspective McNichol adopts is surprisingly modern. The viewer situated at the bottom of the hill looks up at the girl as the landscape rises sharply, creating a relatively shallow sense of space in which both the viewer and the girl are immersed. So when I say that she's a fan favorite, um, Helen McNichol is, one of, is known as, as one of the most um, successful impressionist painters. And she really adopted the idea of the French impressionists in her treatment of her brush strokes and um, the landscape. Just the amount of uh, detail in the foreground with the foliage and the sort of roughage that she's walking in, just gorgeous. It's such a happy, um, bright painting. So here we have the apple gatherer. So among the largest of McNichols canvases, the apple gatherer joins the little worker as a representation of rural female labor that neither romanticizes nor pities the subject. The central figure reaches to pluck an apple. One hand pulls, uh, uh, pulls a branch out of the way as the other stretches to the tree. The target apple itself is just a hint of red hidden among the green and yellow brushstrokes that make up the leaves. The woman wearing a long apron is in the midst of her labor. Her pose, arms in the air, back curved uncomfortably, 
would have been hard to sustain and will make her body ache at the end of the day. Perhaps this was um, true of the model's labor as well. She has been at her work for a while as her basket is nearly full and her cheeks are flushed with sunburn. So at first glance, when you look at this painting, you know, again, McNichol's use of her, of the brush strokes and the idea of light out in the open air, it seems like a light, airy, um, happy painting. But then when you look at the details that are mentioned um, by the art historian, but in the literature, the idea of her back, you notice that her back is arched, that her cheeks are red, that her basket is almost full, that she seems, you know, you get a feel for the intensity of the labor that's associated with her actions. And it becomes more of a statement painting and more of a, a feminist painting, if you will, showing like the hard work of the, of the woman. But still in true female artist fashion, still making it, still accentuating the beauty in it as well. Um, I, I don't see that at all, that it looks like she's working so hard and she's exhausted and blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I mean, not, I, would, I would never see that if I looked at this painting. Yeah, it's not that she looks like she's exhausted. You know, what it says in the literature is like by the angle of her back arching and her arms uplifted working for the trees and the fact that her cheeks are flushed, it gives the impression that it's labor intensive that would make her exhausted afterwards. You know what I mean? It, it's more analyzing the details of, of the theory like behind the painting. But is it, is it true or is it just his opinion, the art historian's opinion, or does he know for a fact that that was the intention of the artist? Well, that's kind of the whole game of an art historian is, or the whole job of an art historian is to interpret, right? Like, and, and art itself is all about interpretation. So that's why I said that at first glance, when you look at this, like you, you see the, the treatment of the brush strokes, you see the color palette, you see the beauty of the painting. But then when you read interpretations of what art historians have. Like um, she could be just going out to pick some apples to bake. To me. She could be, <laughs> but I do agree that um, from the arch in her back, like she's obviously doing something you know she's working upward um and mostly it's it's the flushness in her in her cheeks that would give the impression to me that like it's hot outside you know okay you know that, that like i said it's open to interpretation but when you see an image of a woman sitting at a cafe drinking a, a cup of coffee or whatever or tea or wine and she has red cheeks there well you assume that her red cheeks as an as interpretation would go you assume that her cheeks are colored with makeup but when you see red cheeks in a field you would interpret that it's hot or she's working hard like you're reading the image that's what interpretation in, in art history is about right if you know the artist or the artist is still living, you can interview the artist and ask them what their intention was when they were painting it. But otherwise, it, it's really just interpretation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So here we have, um, the gleaner. So peasant subjects were popular in the late 19th century, especially with a middle class urban audience that felt nostalgic, nostalgic for the pre industrial age. This imagery also helped to shape the contemporary understanding that the physical appearance of the body revealed a person's social class. So mom, this dives deeper into what we were just discussing. While not as political um, in intent as other artists who took up the subject of rural labor, such as Gustave Courbet and Jean-Francois Millet, for example, McNichol's um, unsentimental images of rural female labor participate in this discourse. 
The gleaner, uh, for example, although the woman is young and pretty, her hair is tied up in a messy bun, her face and neck are sunburnt, and you can see clearly the difference between a rosy cheek in the previous image and a sunburn in this one. It's like covering the whole bottom of her face. Um, and her rough hand is clenched around the heavy bundle of hay. Contemporaries would have read these characteristics as signs of difference from the middle class white feminine ideal represented in other McNichol paintings, um, such as the girl in the, the first painting that we saw. McNichol's laboring rural subjects were well received by critics in Canada who compared her art favorably to that of her French peers. Her work is characterized by simplicity of composition and breadth of treatment and breadth uh, of treatment allied with undoubted strength um, and an eye for the poetic in common subjects, common objects, I should say. Um, her work is exceedingly uh, promising and seems to indicate that later on, she may be able to do for the habitant types of French Canada, something of what Millet did for the peasantry of France. So that was a, an art historian who had been writing or a critic who had been writing um, at the time not now. Um, but do we see a, a difference in the subject from the previous painting and, and this one? Like this one, she's clearly, you know, picking apples isn't considered to be labor intensive in theory, but if you have to, if it's an orchard and you have to pick apples from a hundred trees, like yes, but the act of what was seen in the previous image doesn't seem as labor intensive as this one does. The other thing is, is that in the previous image, you can't see the look on the woman's face. In this one, oftentimes when you can see a person's eyes, like you get a better feeling for the way that they're feeling. Yeah, this one, she looks like she's, she's very thin to begin with. She looks like she, she's very wiry, like she's, worked hard all her life her hand is yeah she she looks like she's a worker for sure yeah you know the other one could more be um you know how it was said you know romanticizing sort of like the chores of of, of an everyday of an every romanticizing everyday chores you know so that could be that last one uh, with the apples. Sorry, I have to escape if I want to go backwards. So that could be more of the idea here, but it's also the treatment of the background. If you look at the treatment of this background, it, like the background isn't romanticized as much. Here, the foliage is really, is really romanticized. Like it's really meant to be more beautiful. And it's about the woman in the field. Whereas this one is really about the woman's task at hand, what she's doing. Right. So again, I remember I said that hay fields were something that were that were um, painted by quite a few people at this era in France and also um, here. And Gustave Courbet and Jean Francois Millet, who were um, realist painters genre painters who, who painted the uh, lower class. Um, they also painted a lot of, of, or not a lot, but they also painted imagery um, in hay fields and did, um, you know, the gleaners, the people who would collect the hay um, is a common subject in painting ar around this time the idea of uh, class separation. So stubble fields is one of several hay field scenes by McNichol. The others including reaping time and as not that the previous image was in the hay field but it had to do with, with hay. Um, these harvest scenes are often represented as glowing in the warm sun with small figures working in fields. McNichol returned to this theme frequently, suggesting that she may have seen the famed series by Claude Monet, as I said, also uh, he painted them, possibly at the major impressionist exhibition organized by Paul Durand Ruel in London in 1905. McNichol's impressionist brush work is put to good use in these canvases, the loose quality of the strokes giving a strong sense of the haze texture. 
Um, and it says the brilliant yellow and purple tones of stubble fields also show an awareness of late 19th century color theory popular in impressionist and post post impressionist circles. As I mentioned um, before, when we first saw the work of uh, Morris Cullen, I, I mentioned the, the yellows of Impressionism and um, Van Gogh specifically with his use of yellows and purples um, in his work. You know, yellow and purple being complementary colors, they contrast well when you're trying to achieve light and dark and you don't want to use um, black and white. So some Impressionists used black and white um, as um, contrasting colors in their works when, when they used, you know, more high contrast paintings and more with more stark uh, coloring. But a lot of Impressionists ha had this style of very kind of soft imagery and a way to soften your image or to keep your image soft is without is by omitting the use of black and white. So for a lot of um, them, they, they use high contrasting colors like a purple and a yellow. Again, this kind of um, idea was used, you know, it, it's not brand new to Impressionism to use other colors besides black and white as contrasting, um, as contrasting when you're trying to get um, effects of light and dark. In the Renaissance, um, you know, just like uh, chiaros chiaroscuro was used a lot in Baroque paintings for the high contrast of, of black and white. In the Renaissance, there was like a, a technique called uh, cangiante, uh, which was the use of contrasting colors instead of using black and white because in Renaissance in a lot of like paintings that they weren't used so they would use like red and green or yellow and green or yellow and red to try and show the difference um, in layers of, of things. So like I feel like this kind of color theory could be rooted in, in something like that. Is one of my faves. I love this one. This is the chintz sofa. So it depicts the London studio McNichol shared with her partner, um, her painting partner, British artist Dorothea Sharp, who poses in the painting. Although the image appears at first glance to show a scene of quiet feminine domesticity, uh, art historian Natalie Lukic suggests that the figure in the chintz sofa could be seen as a suffragette working on a piece of memorabilia for the women's rights movement. Um, in 1913, which is when this painting was created, the suffrage um, campaign was at the height of its militant phase. Press reports on the violent protests and civil disobedience following the dismissal of the Reform Bill would have run alongside news of McNichol's election to the Royal Society of British Artists. In the art world too, women fought for equal um, access. And this painting is seen by some to be um, a kind of love letter to that. Aesthetically, um, what's interesting is, is all of the detail in the floral pattern of the sofa um, juxtaposed against the simplicity of that curtain. You know, if you put your hand over the bottom part of the painting, starting at her head, like it doesn't really look like such an interesting painting. And if you put your hand over the top part and you only look at the bottom, well, it looks like it's very busy. But the two pitted against each other, uh, you know, the whole painting is well balanced out because of the way the different elements were, were placed in the layout of the painting. And again here, you know, you, you can see that the, not just from the title, 
But the element that stands out most in the painting isn't the woman sitting on the couch, but in fact, the couch itself. It's almost like the woman is an accessory on the couch rather than a couch being an accessory in a portrait type thing. Here we have sunny September, um, which is a pleasant scene of a woman and children who appear to be sightseeing. Their clean white dresses suggest that they are not local, but middle-class tourists enjoying the view. In the Edwardian period, tourism was a relatively recent form of leisure and day tripping scenes were popular subjects for French and American impressionists. McNichols beach scenes join uh, those of artists such as Claude Monet, um, in imagery like this. So you can see that the, although this doesn't seem to be like a beach scene, you have the, the beach to the far right and then you can see the ocean in the background. So this is really the brush at the edge of the, um, at the edge of the beach. We can tell that it's windy outside because of the brush strokes are um, executed in, in different directions. Like they're on the horizontal, some diagonal to um, give the idea of movement. And again, also the parasol um, lending to the idea of middle class being able to protect yourself, having money to be able to protect yourself like from the sun rather than getting sunburned. Not just, um, you know, when it talks about the, the white clothing, like, yes, that was considered, if you had clean white clothing, you were considered to have enough money to stay clean, quote unquote. Um, but also uh, the white clothing against all of the color of the background really makes, really is really complimentary. It makes both stand out. There's a comment here. And the girl holding her hat. That's to do with the wind. Yes, exactly. But it always blows my mind how in these paintings where you see it so windy, just like when we saw, was it Morris Cullen's, was it Morris Cullen or was it Clarence Gagnon? I think it was Clarence Gagnon, the, the beach scene before. Um, you know, everybody's like, hair is blowing in the wind and their hats are blowing in the wind, <laughs> but nobody's parasol is like flipping outside, inside out or, or being blown away, you know? like those things in the wind would for sure pick up the wind and, and fly away. But they always seem to remain so sturdy. Maybe and the umbrellas in those days were different. Yeah, but even in the, the beach scene before, there was like a, like a tent. I get like a, a tent, yeah. I, I guess like to, to shade um, yeah. babies or whatever. But the tent didn't seem to be moving in the, in the wind either. And if things were made differently back then, well, maybe they should go back to making things the way that they used to, because these days your umbrella would definitely blow away. Okay, um, we are going to do Emily Carr. And I think after Emily Carr, and after Emily Carr, we are going into the group of seven. And I think that'll have to wait until next week. So I emailed um, Liz Vezina, who is our organizer, to tell her that as I'm going through my material, I realized that I have way too much to, uh, in, in this section of uh, Impressionism Group of Seven and Beaver Hall Group, to be able to successfully fit it all in and be able to do the other two sections that we have uh, remaining. So I asked her if I should cut out certain things or if we could add a week on and she graciously agreed to um adding a week on so thank you very much for that and that yay means 
Yeah, so we'll be able to take our, our time um, a little bit more through, uh, through these last couple of weeks. Um, okay, that being said, going into um, Emily Carr. Here we have Totem Walk at Sitka. Um, so this shows the level of Carr's artistic ability and her, uh, after her early conservative training in San Francisco and London, England. Made during the voyage to Alaska that she took with her sister Alice. This is an important um, painting. She was conflicted at the time, collected, collecting curios made by Aboriginal people while simultaneously grappling with the conceptual and stylistic achievements of their culture. From 1907 to 1910, Carr embarked on a series of paintings that reveal her ethnographic framing of Aboriginal subjects. In these works, she documents villages and their inhabitants. She depicts totem poles, structures, and uh, people, and on occasion focuses on individuals. Executed primarily in watercolor, Totem Walk reveals the traditional naturalistic techniques of composition, style, and coloration that she learned in art school. Um, she records a group of Klinglet and Haida poles that had been displaced from their traditional sites and erected within a newly constructed park after their display at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. Totem Walk marks an epiphany, a turning point for Carr. Um, it was at Sitka on the encouragement of an American artist that she decided to pursue her project of documenting the totem poles and Aboriginal villages in the province. So two things that should be mentioned here before we go any further is that number one, I'm mentioning Carr now before we go into the group of seven because she was never actually part of the group of seven, although she did work closely with them at times and had exhibited with them. She's not considered one of the um, members. She's considered, you know, they have members, then they have like members by association, and then they have non-members. So Emily Carr and Tom Thompson are not members of the group of seven. We are looking at Carr right before the group of seven, and we will look at Thompson right after the group of seven. Um, also, that what needs to be mentioned when we look at the work of Carr is, um, you know, after we looked at Indigenous art, um, I went into, or sorry, after we looked at uh, religious art, we went into um, imagery such as uh, from Paul Kane. So that was considered colonial art before, consider before Confederation that I mentioned that um, uh, Indigenous people have issue, take issue with it because it's, you know, romanticizing or making exotic genocide that happened um, at the beginning of, like, when Canada was being, or what is now Canada, when this land was being um, colonized. So, a lot of Indigenous people and art historians have looked at that work as, you know, yes, it existed, it's part of art history, but there is also a um, big issue with it because of the pretense that it was created under. Well, some people, art historians and Indigenous, um, take issue with the work of Emily Carr too, because it's considered to be appropriation. Appropriation in the sense that you know, she made money off of documenting um, the life and culture of the vanquished um, indigenous people of the vanquished uh, culture. And also the fact that she's recreating already indigenous imagery by painting totem poles you know, totem poles are the art piece themselves. She's repainting art pieces and making money off of it when they were never meant to be made money from. Um, so as we go through, and, and there's arguments on, on either side of the coin, on either side of the spectrum. And, um, you know, a lot of people would say, a lot of people have said that, you know, she was very close um, with the Indigenous population that she was documenting and others say that, you know, she 
was just using them. So just something to keep in mind, both sides, as we um, look at her work and as you move forward and potentially look at more of her work in the future. So somebody, a lot of people don't know that she also did um, impressionist work such as uh, this one. People really only know her um, for her uh, totem work and for her um, more in indigenous um, reflections. But this autumn in France was painted um, in Brittany um, and is a dramatic depiction of the French landscape reflecting a remarkable leap forward in Carr's accomplishment because um, she used to paint more realistically. So no longer worrying over fine details, she uses bold brushstrokes, which reflect the influence of post-impressionism to suggest an overall um, movement. So post-impressionism goes even a level further than impressionism in loosening, uh, in the loosening of brushstrokes and um, in the sort of blurring of imagery and, and in, kind of towards abstraction. And this is what we're um, seeing here in this example of her work. I just wanted to show this because I felt like it was a nice, um, it's a surprising image when you think about her repertoire. Um, as I said, a lot of people aren't familiar with this, um, this uh, corner of her work. Here we have um, work that people more, more traditionally associate with her. So this is Tanu. So Carr's return to Canada from France in 1912 marked a renewal on her project to document First Nations villages in British Columbia. Painted in 1913, Tanu um, from the Queen Charlotte, Queen Charlotte Islands, that's the QCR, is an ambitious work that exhibits the strength of her European training. She uses sweeping modulations to create a moving vibrant landscape from the beach to the totem poles, to the dark forest and sky. Um, the flat outlines Carr learned in France assist her in creating a faithful if rough rendering of each figure carved into the poles. So this is more informed by um, impressionism than it is informed by post-impressionism because her the the curvature and the lines are still quite tight on this. Um, we see, we'll see as we move um, sort of forward in her work that she be it becomes more um, abstracted and more associated with uh, post-impressionism and then even towards cubism. So here we have um, totem poles. So th this painting um, and Tanu, which we just saw, were included with works by the Group of Seven in the 1927 exhibition of Canadian West Coast art, native and modern um, at the gallery, at the National Gallery of Canada. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, she was associated with the group of seven and like I said, exhibited with them, but she was never actually um, part of them. But it was because of that exhibition that people uh, so closely associate her work with theirs. Also because they were painting at the same time in the same country. Um, and all of their work kind of challenged traditional views of, landscape and, and outdoor um, art and the Canadian of the Canadian landscape. Um, and their styles influenced each other. Um, but still Carr's work remains quite different than theirs. I also find that with her work, like she had a, a way in, in some of her paintings to like some of her paintings I, I've had to like look twice because they look like they're done in watercolor. Um, 
but they're actually oil on canvas. And I, I guess it has to do with her color pal palette and the application of her paint. But some of her colors, when she does them, when she applies them, they have this like translucent kind of like feel to them. Like they don't seem so very opaque as some of the others using oil. Maybe that's why. So here is where I say that it moves from, you know, to post-impressionism and even towards cubism. So this is Indian church, one of Carr's most important works. A dense wall of forest engulfs the church, which Carr paints in vivid white, a stark contrast to the dark forest. Against this backdrop, the church is miniaturized, uh, signifying both the incursion and the vulnerability of the uh, new beliefs. Sorry, I just lost my place. Of the new beliefs introduced by the settler population, the small church built by the local tribe of the Yukot community symbolized for Carr the First Nations hybrid assimilation of Christianity, which she regarded as a sympathetic version of a faith she shared. Um, as if in some sort of time-lapse photography, the small cross at the apex of the church steeple seems to fall uh, to earth, multiplying into a cluster of crosses marking the graves of the dead. These crosses suggest a gathering of the faithful and at the same time stand in testament to the church's failed mission. The building's windowless walls and reduced features create another marker suggesting a structure that is both monolithic and uninhabitable. Carr's rendering reveals the mission's loneliness and impossibility. The tree bows uh, lean down heavily and sweep up forcefully from the bottom of the picture as if to show the implausibility of a meeting place between two vastly different spiritual forces. So again, you know, as I mentioned before, some people and some schools of thought take um, issue with her interpretations um, of the tribes and their position, um, you know, of the tribes and, and their their way of life and um, the realities that they were living as a result of colonialism. Some people see it as her trying to showcase that to open people's eyes to the wrong that was being done, but some people feel like she was making money off of showing that um, and, and benefiting, benefiting off of it more than the tribes themselves. You can draw your own conclusions. Um, I think we're coming up to 2.30 here. So this is Vanquished. We have one, two, three. Does every, Everybody have time for three more slides of Emily Carr and we can end it there or should I wait until next week? Does anybody have an opinion? Okay, let's do it. So this is Vanquish. This was one of the first images that I showed um, at the very beginning of our course on the first week. Um, to me, this is very, this sort of signifies like, this is this is Carr's work, you know, like th this image is very reflective of what her work was to me. Um, and on a Canadian art level, we have different styles of painting in here. You have a very cubist sky, you have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you have sort of the um, post-impressionist uh, aspects in her mountains and in the treatment of her um, grass and the logs in the foreground are almost actually quite realistically um, painted. So she's very, at this point in her career, very well versed in, in different styles. So it was completed soon after she painted Indian Church in 1929 and she uses a new heavily modeled sculptural language to carve out a scene of desolation and ruin. As she explains in her autobiographical work, in an abandoned village site, a row of crazily um, tipped totem poles straggled along the low bank skirting um, Skaden's Bay. Somebody's um, microphone isn't on mute. 
Uh, in their bleached and hollow upper ends stood coffin boxes boarded endwise into the pole by heavy cedar planks boldly carved with the crest of the little huddle of bones inside the box, bones that had once been a chief of eagle, bear, or white clan. Carr's salvage paradigms emerges clearly in both paint, uh, in, in this painting. In the 1930s, displaced or commissioned totem poles were featured at World's Fair and exhibitions as part of an emerging national vision for Canada. At the same time, a growing tourist economy sought to exploit traditional Aboriginal arts. By contrast, Carr was determined to attest to the impact of the colonialism on village life. Um, so here, aesthetically, we can see that it's a, you know, the, the idea behind the imagery is very dark, but the imagery itself is also quite dark. There's not a lot of happy colors being used here. There's not a lot of bright or light colors being used. The painting feels very heavy um, and it feels very serious. So this is, again, imagery that perhaps you're not super familiar with from Carr. So this is called Grey. And um, in around this era, Carr spent a lot of time in uh, New York. And while she was there, she met um, Georgia O'Keeffe. And this painting is very clearly uh, influenced by O'Keeffe's style. Its ambiguous space is heightened by the reduction of color, suggesting a liminal spiritual space with its own purely formal terms of reference. The concerns of representation have taken a backseat to the spiritual possibilities of abstraction. So she's moving towards um, more and more towards abstraction um, in her later work. And if you like, if you're familiar with Lauren Harris's work, which we're going to see next week, it also starts to look a little bit resemblant of the um, spikes and peaks in his work. So next week, we're going to talk um, a bit about theosophy, which was a kind of religion slash philosophy kind of hybrid um, that a lot of artists around that time were very interested in that was basically geared towards karma and um, what happened to one after after death. And it was very spiritual, uh, more spiritual than, than religion based, I, I think. And um, anyway, a lot of artists who were into theosophy, their imagery started being informed by theosophy and, and we'll see um, sort of tidbits of how it affected artists stylistically and we'll think back to this painting and maybe we'll come back and look at it because as much as it's a uh, very re resemblant of Georgia O'Keeffe's style it also plays into that whole idea of um, theosophy and then here you know she goes from her landscapes to doing these kind of like abstracted forms sort of in the O'Keeffe style. And then she brings that style into her landscapes. And at first, when you look at this, it looks completely abstract. But then when you look at the bottom of the painting, you realize that it's a forest and those are all tree trunks. Um, also by reading the title. <laughs> so uh, in the early 1930s, after traveling to New York, Carr moved from studies uh, to large conceptual paintings. These works reveal a transformation in her art from her preoccupation with Aboriginal subjects to conceptual explorations in which the forests and trees become um, armatures upon which she explores more abstract motifs. So again, I wanted to show this sort of corner of her, her painting style and the evolution of it because I really feel like when people think about Emily Carr, they only sort of associate one aspect of her painting career and that is um that which documented her um aboriginal um tribe kind of days uh, her indigenous like when she lived with the indigenous or when she used to go in and work with them but her the breadth and depth of her um 
portfolio is really very, very interesting. So I encourage you to uh, do a deeper dive into her work and uh, the different aspects um, of her work and what they were informed by because she was a very, very interesting artist. Um, so that is going to, oh no, is there one more? Sorry, this is the last one. Uh, this is Odds and Ends. And um, during the last decade of her career, Carr's awareness of ecological, ecological issues of the day emerged in her painting. In Odds and Ends, the cleared land and tree stumps shift the focus from the majestic forest scapes that lured European um, and American tourists to the West Coast to reveal instead the impact of clear cuts and deforestation. Her concern with the force of industry and its environmental impact developments that were evident in outlying regions near the BC capital paralleled her concern with encroachments on the lives of Indigenous people. Large scale industrial logging had begun in British Columbia in the 1860s and its influence was visible. Paintings from this period reveal Carr's anxiety um, as her choice of subject becomes the threatened landscape itself. Before starting this series of works, which began with um, a painting called Scorned as Timber, the, another one, Beloved Sky, and a third, Loggers Calls, uh, Carr writes, there is a torn and splintered ridge across the stumps I call the screamers. These are the unsawn last bits, the cry of the tree's heart wrenching and te tearing apart just before she gives that sway and the dreadful groan of falling that dreadful pause while her executioners step back with their saws and axes resting and watch. It's a horrible sight to see a tree felled, even now, though the stumps are gray and rotting. As you pass among them, you see their screamers sticking up out of their tombstones, as it were. They are their own tombstones and their own mourners. So, as I said, she had a lot of, um, interesting aspects to her um, portfolio and really concerned with um, a lot of different aspects of what were happening, of what was happening in the province of British Columbia um, around her at that time and throughout her career. And uh, you see it evolve from the sort of early 1900s or let's say after she came back from France. So, you know, 1912, right into the 1940s or ends of the 30s, beginning uh, of 40s. Um, and so, uh, as I said, I, I, I really suggest to all of you to do a, a deeper dive this week into her um, work. And maybe if you do do that um, dive in, into her work and we come back next week, um, if anyone has a, another painting that they'd like to send me um, through email that you want to discuss or add into the lecture, or if you have anything to say on it um, next week, then that would be, uh, it would be great to, to hear your opinions or to hear anybody who has something to share. So that will be the end of our course for this week. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I went over. That's um, okay. But I just wanted to finish up Impressionism so that we're starting next week with the group of seven and then we'll um, go into the Beaver Hall group uh, following that. Great. Thank you, thank you so much, Erin. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. That was really great. Thank oh, you, Erin. Cool. And um, for those who didn't um, make it today or who came in uh, later or whatever, um, Please, if you have any comments to, to email me um, or if you have any questions, go ahead. Okay? Great. Yep. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.